Well, good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. My name is Rosalind Pierce. I'm the Executive Director of HealthWatch Oxfordshire, and I'm going to be chairing the meeting, the event this afternoon, or is it evening? It's evening, isn't it? Um, I think we might have one or two more people waiting to join, but I think um, given that time is precious, we should really um, kick on now. Um, before the um, session starts, I just need to take you through some a bit of housekeeping. Um, so, um, just to take you through how to take part in this meeting, it's a virtual meeting and is open to anyone to attend. Um, so far, I can see we've got about 36 people in the room, which and counting, so that's great. Um, please, can you mute your microphones um, and raise your hand, your virtual hand, if you would like to ask a question in the in the when we get to the question session. Uh, we also have a British Sign Language interpreter online to assist. You can post a comment or question in the chat during the meeting and we will do our best to respond before the end. As you can see on this slide, um, the, the, uh, the where you sort of want to, if you want to write in the your question in chat, it's on that um, button there. And if you're um, looking, can you all see the slides? Yeah. Um, and if you need to raise your hand, then then it's on at the top left as well. Um, after the meeting, we will publish a recording of the meeting on the engagement portal hosting the Integrated Care Partnership Strategic Priorities Engagement, and we'll pick up any unanswered questions in the in the questions and answers list. Please be aware of this that we're recording and it will be published um, as you participate in the event. If you haven't already, we would like you to complete the questionnaire on your voice and Buck in Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West engagement portal. Um, we will provide details of how to access that at the end of this meeting. So the meeting is going to be um, an hour long and I will aim to finish at six o'clock. Um, but before we, we start, I'd just like you to introduce you to um, panel members who are here with us today, who will be uh, available to um, hear, hear your comments and take your questions. Um, we have, I don't know if I can see them at the moment, it's really difficult here. Um, we have um, Councillor Liz Lefman. Yes, who's the, good evening. Oh, great. Wonderful. Who's um, the leader of Oxford County Council and the chair of the um, Oxen Health and Wellbeing Board, an integrated care partnership member. 
We also have Councillor David Rowan, who's leader of South Oxford District Council, Oxfordshire District Council and an integrated care part partnership member. Are you there, David, somewhere? Good evening. Yes, I'm here. Oh, great. Uh, and Saf Azar, who is our Director of Public Health at Oxfordshire County Council. Are you there, Ansar? Yes, I'm here. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, Dan Leveson, who's Oxfordshire Place Base Director for um, the Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West Integrated Care Board. Hi, everyone. Great. Rob Byrne, who's the Deputy Director of Strategy at the Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West Integrated Care Board. Evening, everybody. Wonderful. And Rob Beasley, who's the Interim Director of Communication and Engagement at the Buck Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West Integrated Care Board. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. Well done for saying that out loud every time, Ros. Yeah, well, I, you know, I can't tell people to stop using acronyms if I then use them. So just, just for that, um, you will see on the slide it says Bob ICB. Well, that's the Berkshire, the Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, Berkshire West Integrated Care Board. Um, so I'd like to move directly on to the presentation, and uh, Rob Byrne is going to take us through that. So over to you now, Rob. Brilliant, thank you, Ross. Um, just before we get going on the uh, on the presentation itself, um, the, the the purpose of the conversation tonight is uh, really to provide um, all, all of those on the call an opportunity to provide feedback um, on the draft strategy that's being developed. So to try and aid that, what what I'm going to do is that I'll talk very quickly through uh, what the strategy is, what it's for. And then I'll go through a little bit of the content about uh, what we've included, um, but recognising that this strategy has been pulled together um, by a huge number of people uh, that are representing lots of uh, organisations across the geography. Um, and some of those are on the call, so we might be just sharing some of the uh, some of the questions, the way that we answer some of those questions as we get through. Um, so so let, let me jump in. The uh, Berkshire, uh, sorry, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West um, have come together in uh, what, what's known as an integrated care system. With, within that geography, uh, there are nearly two million people. Um, and uh, when, when we think about those two million people, uh, sort of as we compare them to the national average, generally, uh, we've got a population that are healthier and live longer lives in good health. Um, but as we've been looking at what are some of the priorities that we want to set for the population, we know that uh, there is significant variation between our geographies. Uh, we, we know that there are difference between populations. And so the priorities that we try to uh, that, that we've identified through this strategy are things that we think uh, our priorities across all of those areas, but we recognise that there are needs to do things differently in different places. Um, the, the population is expected to grow. We know it's expected to grow quite significantly, um, uh, but that growth itself is not uh, going to be even. Uh, we're expecting uh, the majority of that growth to be with uh, some of the, um, uh, the people in our population that will be over 65. Um, so that we're, through all of these things, we're, we've been trying to be aware of what the population needs will be. But those needs are going to be met by all sorts of different organisations. I'm sorry, Erica, if you could just flick on to the next. Um, uh, sorry, back one. Uh, thank you. All those, those needs are going to be met by uh, all sorts of different organisations. Uh, some of those are NHS organisations, some of those are um, uh, are associated with local authorities, um, some of those are voluntary sector organisations, um, and the way that we have tried to organise ourselves uh, is, is by thinking about how can we come together to serve the needs of the population best. Um, across the whole of the, the geography that we've got here, we've got something called the integrated care system, which is really just uh, all of those different organisations that are involved in the health and care delivery. Um, 
but the oversight of the that system is picked up by a an organize a, a committee that's come together which is called the integrated care partnership i'm drawing attention to that because that is the organizer uh, that that is the bit of the system that is um uh, that that will own the strategy and is setting the direction of strategy uh, direction of travel for the system if we can flick on erica the strategy itself, the, the purpose of the strategy is to set a really clear direction for the whole of the system. Um, it's, it, it's there to uh, set the uh, di direction of travel. Sorry, I've lost the slides on my screen. Can, can other people see them? Yeah, we can see them. Yeah, yeah we can see oh, them. Brilliant. OK. Um, so the uh, oh, right, fine. Let me just refer to my my notes then. So the the strategy itself is there to set a clear direction for the system, uh, but it's it's there to do a number of other things as well. So it's it's there to try and work out how we can be working differently as a group of organisations that are involved in the health and care of our of our populations but also to try and think about how we can try and do things potentially differently. Um, so that's trying to think about actually how do we uh, try to do more in terms of prevention? How do we recognise that there are inequalities in the way that people access and experience uh, health and care across the system and, and doing things differently? But also recognising that we've got the opportunity of, of working across a number of different organisations um, to solve some of the challenges that we've got or to learn about how to do things better. This document is is trying to set out how potentially we, how, how we can do that across the whole of the system. So let's flick through in terms of some of the content. Um, we agreed that there was uh, uh, the Erica, if you could just flick on the, the the vision that we agree. So this this is the sort of the the unifying direction that we want uh, that that was agreed through the uh, the different working groups um, was to try and get the whole of the. Um, I've, sorry, I've completely lost all of. I can't see anything on my screen at the moment, so which is why I'm. Can you all still see it? I can't see anything. Yeah, we're on the vision slide, our vision, Rob. We are on the vision. OK, I'm sorry about this. Um, we we agreed a uh, a vision uh, that, that was for the people of the Bob area to have the best possible start in life, to live happier, healthier lives for, every, uh, for longer, um, and to be able to access the right support. And we can see that as we uh, go through some of the detail. Those are themes that are picked up as we as we get into more detail. Um, we had five principles. So those five principles are things that we uh, are seeing that cross cut through all of the um, the priorities that we identified. And those principles are uh, are things that we agreed that were really, really important for us to get right through all of the services and care and support that we provide for our populations. Uh, the, the principles are around uh, trying to keep people well for as long as possible, so preventing ill health. The next was about uh, tackling some of the, uh, the areas where we know that there's differences or variation between the way that people access uh, experience uh, some of the services that we provide and the outcomes that they receive. Uh, the, the third is about recognising that there's more that we can do to provide services that are personalised or tailored to individuals' needs and a commitment to trying to work with individuals and communities to make sure that those services are, uh, are more tailored to individuals and communities' needs. Um, then the last two, we've got a balance between some of the uh, the ways in which we will be providing those services 
Uh, and the first is thinking about how we can be really local in the way that we deliver the majority of our services. So taking a local first approach to what we are delivering. And the second is taking, taking advantage of where we've got the opportunity of scale and doing things uh, in a different way, working more collaboratively across our different organisational boundaries and our, our geographical boundaries. We've then got five themes that I'll go through really quickly. I won't go through all of the detail because I'm, I'm sure people have had an opportunity to look at the document. We've got five themes that uh, the, the first one is about promoting and protecting health. Um, so that is has has a really important uh, principle that we want to take forward. It recognises that that many people suffer from uh, poor health conditions uh, that are things that could be prevented or delayed. Um, there are a number of health behaviours that uh, impact people's health uh, that, are, that are smoking, physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, alcohol misuse. Those are things that account for up to 40% of the years lived in ill health. Um, so we've got to do more to try and support people to stay well. But we recognise that a huge amount of that is also impacted by the circumstances in which we live. So it can't just be about thinking about behaviours and expecting to do people to do or be different in, in the decisions that they make. We've got to do more that recognise that there are other factors that influence the, the environments uh, and the decisions that we make. Um, and the final priority that we've got here is, is actually doing more to support uh, the spread of disease um, through thinking about uh, challenges that we've got around immunisation and vaccination programmes. This, the second theme is about trying to support a good start in life. Um, so we've got the ambition here to help all children achieve the best start in life. Um, the, the early years and uh, in, in a child's development are absolutely crucial for the person's longer term health and well-being. Uh, the, those early years impact uh, how pe the people's health through their school years and well into adulthood. Um, and there are a number of things that we wanted to target here um, in terms of supporting that better start to uh, better start to life. The first is around uh, maternal health and doing what we can around maternal health and then through into early years and supporting uh, the development of uh, of children in uh, the years naught to five. We then recognise that um, particularly following the pandemic, there are a number of challenges that we've got around mental health and trying to support well-being for children. Um, and then there are particular needs for children with special education needs and disabilities. And uh, we wanted to flag that and recognise that as a priority across uh, both our NHS local authorities and voluntary sector organisations that are working within the area. Um, and, and the fourth then is, re is recognising some of the challenges that some children face when they're transitioning from or they're moving from services that are designed uh, specifically for children into services that are more focused around delivery and support for adults. Um, the, the third theme is around living well. Um, this, this again is trying to uh, identify priority areas where we can support people and communities to stay healthy. Um, and this is focusing on preventing specific diseases uh, or long term conditions. Um, and the priorities that we have identified here are around cardiovascular disease, understanding that um, cardiovascular disease is one of the most common causes of death within our geographical area and there's much more that we can do uh, to reduce this being uh, something that contributes to the significant gap in life expectancy that we've got between some of our areas. The, the other priorities that we identified here were around mental health and um, better and earlier screening and diagnosis for people who have cancer or suspected cancer. 
The fourth theme was around supporting people who, as they are aging and getting older, um, recognizing that there are challenges that people face. And in terms of health and care, uh, trying to identify ways in which we can work with or support those, those people as they're getting older. Um, the, the priorities here are really around trying to keep people healthier and independent for as long as we can, um, recognizing that there are challenges around social connectedness for some people. Uh, there's, um, as some of those care needs become more complex, that there are different ways that we could potentially provide support. Uh, to be more joined up in the way that that support and care is received by individuals. Um, and then recognising that actually there is a huge and very important role that carers play in uh, in the delivery of that care. Um, and there's again, there's there's more that we could be doing to support uh, carers. The final theme is a theme around access and access to quality services. Um, we we know that that's something that's a challenge um, and the, uh, the the priority areas that we identified here were uh, about trying to understand how we can provide better support to people really close to where they live through uh, teams that are um, focused around their neighborhoods um, and that will link closely with some of our um, other local services then there's there's a challenge about trying to understand uh, what more can be done uh, around planned care and elective care services. Uh, and finally, understanding how we how we can potentially think differently to uh, provide the urgent care that people need when they need it, recognising that uh, there are significant pressures on some of our hospital services, but the, the care and support that people need at that point could be provided by other providers, uh, other services that are not those hospital based services. So trying to um, think about how we can support people access those different services at different points. So those are the five thematic areas that we identified in terms of. Next steps, shall I? Pause there, Ros, and then maybe we can come back to the next steps as we close. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good idea. OK, so um, thank you very much, Robert. Um, just quickly, I know some of the um, people in the room have had difficulty, had some difficulties um, during the presentation of Access Insights. So I apologise for that, but I think most people are sorted out now. Um, it's an opportunity now for um, you guys in the room to have um, your say in terms of what the strategy um, on the, on the strategy is presented to give your feedback and comment. And um, I think, as Robert said at the beginning, um, these will be taken in con into consideration. Yes, you can write your questions, uh, comments in in chat, and they will also be taken into into consideration if we don't get to them online. So. What I would do at this moment now is offer the floor to you guys in the room to ask questions, and I have two already, and I'll take them in order. So, um, Paul Barrow, would you like to ask your question? Uh, thanks, Roz. Um, yeah, so Paul Barrow, I'm the Deputy Chair of HOSC, and uh, I'm also a district councillor as well, in fact. So I guess I'd, I'd like to know to what extent is the ICB engaged with the districts in the development of the strategy, and what's going to be the nature of the dialogue between the local authorities and the ICB within the ICP? Thanks. Thank you, Paul. I think I'll hand that over to Councillor David Brown to answer. Yes, having confidently thought that I wouldn't get any questions, uh, good to see I get the first one. Um, I guess uh, to say at this stage, uh, district council involvement has, has been fairly limited in that uh, anyone's been limited at the moment in that we're out of consultation uh, and the board hasn't actually met yet. But uh, in terms of kind of inherited knowledge, uh, I think our, our main contribution is on the sort of pre-medical stage uh, around health and well-being. Uh, so uh, we we run services, as you well know, Paul, uh, around uh, sports and leisure centres and uh, active communities. Uh, so 
the way in which we feed that in uh, is through engagement like this, uh, but also uh, unlike a lot of the parts of the country, uh, I actually have a seat on this. Uh, I was at a district councillors uh, network meeting where they said 40 percent of uh, uh, the integrated care systems don't include the lower tier authorities in, in their uh, uh, governance. Uh, whereas I'm, I've been put on there specifically to represent the districts and the city. Uh, uh, I guess the county gave up one of their seats for that, uh, for which I'm grateful. But uh, rather than it just being upper tier authorities and health and public health, uh, there was a specific decision uh, within Bob to include uh, the lower tier authorities. This is specifically for Oxfordshire because the other two authorities are a unitary, uh, but Oxfordshire being two tier. Uh, special provision was made for us to to have a seat. Thank, thank you very much. Is um, is is that a satisfactory answer to your question? Yeah, I think, that's, think that's more or less OK, Ross. Yeah, thank you. Great. Good. Uh, Chris Wardley next. Hello, like? I, I, I think the um, the document is quite good actually so I, I, I'm quite pleased with the document but I find it slightly bizarre having 18 priorities how on earth can you have an action plan that delivers 18 priorities were you to, to divide the, the you, you use the word theme unfortunately for for the five groups but were you to call them 18 themes and then select two, three, four priorities, you might have some chance of delivering, in my opinion. Thank you very much. I think that's one for um, Rob Bowen. Very happy to take that. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, you're not the first person to have said that. Um, uh, and and absolutely, we'll, we'll take that into account as we try to think it through. Uh, the 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 things that have been identified as priorities um, will be things that we have an ambition to deliver over a five year period. Um, so they're not all things that need to be priorities from year one. Um, but but again, it's really helpful to get the feedback about uh, how we can improve the document, how we can improve the communication. Um, and yeah, all, all other feedback on that would be welcome. Thank you, Robert. Um, next person with the hand up is Tony Ude. I got that right, Tony? Uh, just about. Yeah, well done. Not many people do. It's <laughs> very <try>. difficult. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm really just a sort of uh, interested member of the public. Um, I have read the document and I welcome particularly the tackling health inequalities and the prevention. There were two questions which are really about the one about the document, one about this session. The first one is there didn't seem to be any distinction between primary and, and secondary health care. Um, and I sort of wondered if that wasn't really part of the strategy. I know it's an extremely complex and contested area, but I wondered if it was that. The other one, given that this is an Oxfordshire session, I wondered if there were any particular Oxfordshire points as opposed to, um, uh, you know, the sort of more general whole area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Can I take the second question first and perhaps ask Councillor Lefman to, to take that on? Thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you for your questions. Um, I think the main thing to remember is that although the ICS and the ICB and indeed the ICP are ex extend across the whole of the region, and this strategy is about what we're going to do from a regional perspective, there will be a place-based partnership board which will be looking specifically at how we deliver services in Oxfordshire. Um, and it's really important that we recognise that, you know, when it comes to actually delivering um, care and, and health care on the ground, it has to be at a local level. So that's really a very important part of the whole strategy. Um, so um, the health the, the, the place-based partnership will include uh, local councillors, um, district councillors, as well as county councillors, and of course, officers from both 
both tiers. Um, and we will have the opportunity to work very closely with our healthcare partners um, across the county. And of course, it will be integrated with what we're doing in social care. So I hope that answers that question about how it will operate locally. Um, and I'll leave you to ask the other question, Rosalind, of somebody else, I guess, or the other part of that question. Uh, it was the, thank you. That's the um, lack of the primary care and secondary care element of the question. So I think probably um, if we can ask... Um, uh, do, 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 Ros, do, Ros, would again, you like me to just it? have a first crack at it? Yes, please. Um, so the, the purpose of the document is that it's setting a direction for the whole of the system. Um, and when we're thinking about the whole of the system, there are a huge number of different organisations that will be playing a part in the health and care and support and ambitions that we have for our population. Um, so we, we have tried to be um, sort of agnostic of all of those different types of organisation in the way that we've described it. So the, we haven't drawn attention to um, NHS providers or local authority providers. We've tried to describe a number of priorities that are relevant for our populations and for our communities. And that's been the focus of the way that we've tried to describe it rather than try and describe it from a service perspective. Thank you. Um, I'm going to deviate a moment a bit. We've got a question in chat um, from uh, Neil Topping from the South Oxford Patient Alliance um, asking what is the role of Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee um, of Oxford County Council and how will this body ensure that there are sufficient primary care services to match the increased housing demand in the county? Um, we're also uh, very pleased to have the chair of HOSC um, in, in the room, Councillor Hannah, who's offered to answer that question. If that's OK with the rest of the panel, um, I will ask her to, to step forward. Are you around, Councillor Hannah? Yes, I am. Wonderful. And, Welcome. Uh, question is very close to my heart. <laughs> so, and the, and the heart of HOSC, really. Um, it's something we, we did a lot of work on um, last year. Um, and, and through and, and in the early part of this year, um, we so there's lots of papers you could look at if you if, if you want to look at the reports at HOSC. Um, but uh, very simply, um, we as a result of our scrutiny, um, we co-produced a workshop on uh, primary care um, with the CCG and um, uh, Dan Leveson was there in terms of, who's the place director um, now of Bob um, and uh, Health Watch Rosalind was there um, and uh, we had district representation there we had lots of um, GPs there and um, so it was a very very good opportunity to deep dive into understanding the, the the issues, the barriers and the levers really to how can we make sort of improvements for people because there's obviously been a national trend um, which I think is mentioned in the strategy paper um, that, that you have um, today which which talks about that also being seen across across the bob and, and Oxfordshire you know with a lot of people feeling um, you know, very dissatisfied in terms of, you know, how they can sort of access uh, same day appointments or, you know, in, in, it's, it's, a, it's a very much a, a theme which which people are concerned with. Um, so we made some findings out of that. And as a result of result of that, we were able to make recommendations to um, to um, the cabinet this week um, and we made recommendations to Bob. And um, we've also got some recommendations for the Secretary of State. But relating to that particular issue about areas experiencing major housing growth without the, uh, the, the infrastructure provided in a, in a timely way, um, we, one of our recommendations was actually that, um, that there was capacity sort of within the BOB to engage um, with local authorities um, in terms of spending money from housing developments, but also just in terms of, you know, making sure 
that you know when housing developments get put in that that health is healthcare needs are, are properly sort of considered um but also to the Secretary of State, you know, we have highlighted the fact that really we need capital funds devolved um, because the money that comes through from housing developers is 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 rarely enough, um, and that that's a that's a, a major issue in terms of getting timely bills. So it's obviously been a big issue in Didcot, and you know there is a temporary solution there now, but you know a permanent solution is needed. It's been a big issue in Wantage, um, and it's a which has been resolved now. We, we're getting bricks on the ground, but that took 12 years, and you know we've got we've got other areas in the county. So I don't know whether we will be having a report to the next meeting of HOSC, which is in February, in terms of which of our recommendations have been accepted, but I I, I am quite hopeful around, around that. Um, the, the other thing just to say from our committee point of view in relation to the strategy, that there's clearly a lot about deprivation, which is absolutely correct, you know, about prevention. But you know, we have seen we have identified in our scrutiny work, you know, the particular issues around rural deprivation, which are often around sort of access to services um, and transport issues sort of around that. And clearly with the Bob, that's that's that that is a, a critical question. So that has been something my committee has certainly put forward to highlight issues of rural deprivation alongside you know, the areas of, of, of uh, the city areas um, where, of course, there's a lot of deprivation, poverty. Um, but there are pockets of poverty in the rural areas as well. And, and so we, we've highlighted that. I hope I hope that's some that's response great. anyway. Thank, but do thank, come to HOSC meetings because we we, we we love engagement. <laughs> thank you very much, Councillor Hannah. There you are. There's the HOSC Roadshow. Um, what the next next person I'd like to call on is Jess Wilshire. Thank you, Roz. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Jess Wilshire. I'm Director of Services for Oxfordshire Mind, um, and we also work in um, Berkshire West. So, yeah, obviously really good to see mental health um, front and centre in, in the strategy and, and also echo that support for, for tackling inequality. And, and I'm hoping that, that us and our communities can contribute to how that plan shapes and um, taking that sort of approach of proportionate universalism if we can so that there is that basic standard everywhere and and then we're tackling our our inequalities on top of that I'm wondering if there's scope to to pick up mental health in that first theme and priority because I think for us that promoting good mental health and and protecting good mental health and well-being that preventative angle is really important in mental health as it is in in physical health and I'd like to see that sort of parity of of representation in the strategy if that's possible. Thank you very much Jess. I wonder whether um, Dan, you, Dan Leveson, would, whether you'd like to take that one? <laughs> well I think it's more for uh, the ICP strategy as a whole but as Jess knows so um, we are we're, we've got the Oxfordshire Mental Health Partnership and there's a one of the priorities for us locally in Oxfordshire is to work together with local authorities, with voluntary sector, community services uh, to address the, the mental health. And I think particularly, Jess, it's that bit, and I think it links back into the health inequalities in reality. What we know is people with severe uh, and moderate mental illnesses have uh, lower life expectancies than, than the rest of the population. And so that's something that we need to work really hard on to, to address. So that'll be something that we do locally but I think uh, you're right. Anything that we can do to to make sure that we're we're promoting mental, emotional, mental health and well-being as part of a prevention agenda would be welcome. I think in the ICP strategy. Thank thank you. Uh, next person on the list is Maggie Winters. Maggie. Hello. Thank you, uh, Ross. Um, and I thought that the uh, the paper, the the consultation paper, had actually got the principles and the aspirations absolutely right. Um, I think it's hugely ambitious, especially for a, a sort of five year period. Um, and the elephant in the room that nobody ever mentions is the fact that success depends to a huge extent on 
national policy, especially around uh, the economic and social determinants of health, which uh, has frankly been on an anti-health trajectory for many years. And what I'd like to know is how does the ICB interact with national government departments to try and ensure that everyone is on the same wavelength? Um, I think Jane um, did sort of touch on this um, in terms of the infrastructure issue in housing development and so on. Um, but so many of the economic and social determinants affect health and unless we get those right and unless we can um, if you like uh, uh, make sure that we bring people's standard of health up to some sensible norm and reduce inequalities um, then then we're just not going to be able to meet you know these these admirable admirable aspirations um, that, that uh, are in the consultation paper. Thank you, Maggie. I wonder whether, um, Ansaf, you'd like to respond to, to that? Yeah, happy to. Uh, I think uh, it's a really important question because uh, we know that uh, it, only about 20 to 25 percent of the health and well-being of the population is determined by healthcare services. Um, the rest of it, it's all determined by the social and the wider determinant elements, which is massively important. And I think that is where the ICP strategy can play a bigger role, because until now, although we try to work in partnership, we have often developed our policies in silos where we have looked at healthcare elements in the healthcare silo and the local government elements in that local government silo. I think what the ICP strategy does, in addition to looking at it in a bigger geographical footprint, it also brings our, 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 our planning teams, our, our place shaping teams, uh, education and employment, all these teams, and at least at a local footprint together to influence some of those decision making. And I think we had a really productive uh, workshop uh, last week where we uh, had a workshop with districts and city partners uh, to get their views on it. And I think one of the things they identified that there's increasingly important role that they can play in the prevention space around those social and wider determinants can play a massive role in not only improving health and well-being of our population, but actually reducing the demand for the health and care system in the future and helping to uh, save resources as well. So I think at a local level, there is there is things that we can do to try and address that. Uh, when you're talking about housing, for an example, housing plays a massive role. We've got a project called Better Housing, Better Health, which is all about improving housing to improve the health and well-being of our population. And we do that particularly in some of our most deprived areas. But in addition to that, there is clearly a national role and we all have to play our advocacy role to try and influence the national policy. So I'm sure Dan Levison will be talking about it from a national point of view and will be raising through the Integrated Care Board things that are of national importance. There is a role to play in the from an anchor institution point, point of view. We've got big uh, workplaces that can influence the agenda. And as a director of public health, I will be also raising the importance of some of the preventative elements from a social determinants point of view, particularly in this current moment from a cost of living crisis point of view. Uh, and, and we'll all be doing that role. I'm, I'm sure that uh, Councillor Lefman, our leader, will also be doing that in her capacity and we'll all be replicating that. Um, but there are things that we can do locally, and we will be we will be using the ICP strategies to influence that, while we actually while actually playing a very strong advocacy role to push the national policy as well. I hope that gives a little bit of an insight. Okay. Thank you very much, Ansaf. Um, I'm I'm going to ask Didi Catherall to ask the question, and then Chris Wardley, you've had your hand up a long time. Um. Thank you. Um, my name is Deborah Cattle. I'm a trustee of a local arthritis charity. And one aspect that goes across um, access to uh, healthcare, particularly preventative healthcare or maintenance of healthcare, obviously, particularly from my point of view from arthritis, but other things as well, is that increasingly people are being taken off this sort of standard healthcare preventative thing um, and are being told to find their own. Um, resources for this, uh, which obviously increases the cost. For those that can't afford it, they are therefore denied those services. 
And for, um, you know, I'm just wondering, given that we're supposed to be integrating care across all the services, um, I'm hoping that that will be addressed, that people are not being um, denied healthcare, which can actually keep them, as they say, um, independent and healthy and living well, simply because they can't afford care that they previously were getting through the health service. I'm thinking, uh, for example, things like physiotherapy and dietary. Um, those are now being restricted quite harshly. And, and people's mobility is being affected. Just hope maybe they, that's not going to go any further and maybe road back to the enabling everyone to have access to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wonder, Robert, whether you'd like to just um, respond to that question and then we'll go on to the next question. Uh, happy to give it a start, but I was in a meeting with ANSAF only this afternoon where we were talking about some of the um, uh, the challenges that we're aware of uh, across the whole of the uh, Bob geographical area um, with with the inequalities in, in the way that people access services and some of the challenges that we know that some of our different populations have. And there are a number of different schemes that are already up and running that will support people uh, travel to uh, appointments, uh, recognise that there are different challenges that people have. Um, but that 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 very question is uh, highlighting a, such an important thing that we are trying to address in this strategy when we identify the the um, the ambition to do more to target inequalities. Um, particularly thinking about areas uh, of, uh, of particular deprivation and trying to be more targeted in the care and support that we provide uh, in those areas. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, the next person with their hand up, which I will go to, is uh, Tracy Rees. Tracy, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks, Rob. Hi. Um, I'm just going to try and take my hand down now. <laughs> I'll do that later. Um, I wanted to ask a question about engagement, and I know this obviously is an engagement session, but in thinking about the fact that um, this is going to be a far more um, uh, cohesive approach in terms of the, the various organisations uh, working at place-based levels, um, I'm very aware that you've got a lot of priorities, it's been pointed out. Actually measuring how you're going to deliver against that isn't just going to rely on uh, quantitative information, it's going to need qualitative information as well. And that's going to come from patients. So how are you engaging patients? Because um, I know that Healthwatch has a role and um, uh, for, a, for a, a, a local team that's um, obviously uh, hands up, I have worked with Ros before, um, that has uh, a limited number of staff to be able to engage, you're going to need more than just Healthwatch. So how are you going to do it? Thank you, Tracy. Um, Rob Beasley, this is yours. It's a very good question, though, isn't it? Um, you know, I think I think even uh, looking at the engagement process that we've got in place for uh, looking at the integrated care partnership strategy, um, certainly as a person sort of uh, one of the people accountable for it, it, we're doing it to a time scale that we wouldn't particularly choose to do it at um, it's you know more compressed than we would have liked and there's a whole load of things that we would like to have done um, if we'd had uh, if we'd had what you know eight to ten weeks uh, to to uh, engage in this process rather than just the six which we've got um, we uh, it's also difficult for me to speak on behalf of all of the other uh, members of the partnership but I know that the integrated care board uh, is uh, is has got an agreed engagement framework which uh, is committed to trying to hear from as many people as possible. And one of the things about the way that one of the changes that uh, that is kind of meant to be built into how uh, we plan and deliver services in the future is about listening to patients, people, and communities uh, as we develop those services because that way we will end up providing better services and get, getting better outcomes. The mechanics of that, frankly, at this stage, I'm not I'm not 
Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is going to be, but it is clearly a commitment from the ICB that that's how we will we, we will be working uh, in the future. Dan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, yeah, I suppose just to add to that, I think part of it is it, it is hard work and it takes time and effort. I think uh, ANSAF and the public health team have done a great job on these uh, local insight reports that are really helping oh, yeah. us make those those connections. So the more that we, the, the big distant NHS organisations, can work with our local communities, neighbourhoods, districts, get in uh, to those places and, and, and hear from people, the better it's going to be. And, and my per personally, I think that there will be a need for lots of formal structured kind of engagement and consultation and communications and things like that. But actually, uh, it's that routine ongoing. It, it becomes a part of how we operate and what we do. And it actually, our commitment to working with voluntary and community sector partners, who I do think have much better connections to local neighbourhoods and much better understanding of their local communities will, will help us do that in the long run. Thank you. Ansef, did you want to come in on this one as well? As Dan was speaking, it was covered. It covered most of the elements that I was going to raise. Um, uh, the 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 community profile that we're doing, which is all about actually not just looking at the data for that uh, community, it's also about actually understanding from the the community perspective what those uh, insights are about the priorities. So I think we'll be continuing to utilise that. We'll be setting up focus groups as part of that. I think this is where the roles of districts and city councils also will be, will be really important. They know their communities really well. I would go a step further and I would say, let's not just talk about patient voice, let's talk about the residents voice, because there will be people who are uh, who are not necessarily accessing uh, services uh, who, who might benefit. So I think well, let's look at it wider in that context. Uh, if you want to not just uh, prevent illness, but promote better health and well-being. I think this is where the strategy can be quite powerful because it's not about health services per se. It's more wider than that. It's about actually understanding the cultural sensitivities of uh, in individual communities, understanding the assets that the individual communities have, how we can utilize them and, and make sure whatever we do, we do, we're doing them with the communities so that there's better ownership. And I think you can't measure them in the quantitative way. You're, you're very right about that. We need to get better at uh, measure, doing things in the qualitative way, uh, and we need to increase our confidence in doing that. I think this this strategy will give us an opportunity to explore in that direction and really push that forward. Thank you. Uh, you're happy with those responses, Tracy? Um, yes, it's a wait to see, really, isn't it? I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be. I think you're going to struggle in five years, but if you can get a basic groundwork in place, then good luck. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to Chris Wardley. Is this a second question or have you got a, a hand that's been up throughout the whole? No, no, of the it's a second question. I'll give you a second bite of the cherry. It's then, about if gender inequalities. World Health Organization recognise internationally there are huge gender dif differentials, mainly adversely affecting women. And for example, the National Institute for Health Research in Oxford have a project in surgical innovation looking specifically at gender issues in surgical uh, surge, uh, adversely affecting females. Why is there no recognition in this document of that sort of at uh, that problem. Well, I, I feel every member of this panel could take a response to that, so I'm going to throw it open to um, whoever wants to go first, because I think it's a very broad question. I think so. So I think, Chris, I think the outcomes for surgical procedures is a is a valid one to raise. I think for, in, within the document, I do think there is quite a lot of uh, emphasis on inequalities and I think there is quite a lot in terms of different outcomes for women uh, if you go through if, if you go through the document in in a bit more detail it may not pick up on the precise thing about surgical outcomes though so it's something that we can uh, consider. Now I'm not looking for surgical outcomes I think it should be one of your 18 I think it should be a 19 theme. I, uh, I, 
I think yeah, there's okay. a lot there's a lot in there like I say I think there is quite a lot in there about um inequalities for uh, gender inequalities throughout the document it may not be another another theme but I do dread the fact that we've had a conversation about having 18 priorities there is a slight danger that we create mm -hmm. another theme okay I, I think it's important that you take this back though to um to consider in, in terms of um, gender inequalities and how that is maybe just reflected more clearly in 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 the document and focus so um can i just take a question from uh the chat room as we're heading towards the end of the session um and um my i it's from um aliki kalianu who basically supports the document but asks um around the roadmap to destination implementation in practical terms of the strategy, what adjustments would be expected to achieve those? That's a broad one again. I think I'll go back to um, Robert Byrne on that one. Uh, really happy to start on that. Thank you for the question. Um, a obviously a huge, hugely important part of this strategy is thinking about what happens next. Um, and given that this is a strategy that is written on behalf of a number of different organizations, the challenge is that we uh, that there is an expectation that all of those organizations will uh, be taking this strategy into account as the priorities um, that have been collectively agreed for the system. So um, in terms of delivery, there, there is an expectation that uh, health and care organisations across Bob will be referring to the priorities that are eventually agreed through this process, um, and that will be reflected in their own local delivery plans. So uh, with my NHS hat on, um, uh, we are currently going through a process at the moment where we're trying to um, agree what our detailed plans are for next year. Um, one of the most important things that we're considering as an input to that process will be the priorities that have been identified through this strategy. Um, so that that is already starting to shape the way in which we are making decisions uh, about some of the things that we'll be doing uh, into next year. But also we're starting to think longer term about um, how we might be able to uh, respond in, in in the longer term to some of these priorities as well. Thank, thank you. Thank um, you. I think I have one more raised hand, or has it gone? It's gone. Oh, I've just raised my own hand. That was clever. Mine was up. Sorry. <laughs> who's the, sorry? Who's that? Jane. Mine okay, was Jane Hannah, if you'd like to go. Yeah, not with my host cat on. Sorry, another hand. Can I just say that we've got two minutes? <laughs> yeah, it's really quick. Um, it was actually whether priority 15 could be reconfigured to include reference to support our workforce and to acknowledge a healthy, well looked after workforce as integral and a strong healthcare system um, and to include that in the wider sense. And I I speak uh, in my hat as, as running a, a voluntary sector charity in, in Oxfordshire. Um, that has involved, has supported and involved um, 32 suddenly bereaved parents, um, sort of, um, you know, you know, that's what we've done. So there's a lot of pain and they have worked with um, the OUH. They've got very strong clinical connections. We've got innovations that are, are relevant in terms of um, uh, reducing A&E and reducing excess mortality. Um, we're interested in those outcomes and um, we're interested in how do we get included in the sort of distribution list in relation to like the voluntary sector and what the voluntary sector has been involved in that development of the voluntary sector strategy. And I'm sure there'll be other organisations as well that because of, I think it, we've heard that it's been quite rushed, that because it's been rushed, there may be organisations that have not been not been in the loop really in relation to the good engagement that's clearly happened with some of the voluntary sector um, before Christmas. So it was it was really how can how can we get involved and and help? Thank you, thank you, Jane. Um, I, uh, Rob Beasley, would you would you like to just respond to that? Um, as the uh, Director of Communications and Engagement um, at the Integrated Care Board. 
fairly quickly. Um, very, very briefly. And so, uh, so um, we we have been working very closely with uh, the uh, BCSE Alliance. Sorry for the acronym, the Voluntary Care and um, Social Enterprise Alliance. And um, William, the chairman of that alliance, is also on the Integrated Care Partnership it's, itself. And they are due to meet. Uh, the partnership is meeting, I think, on is tomorrow. Meeting for the first time. Um, and so there's a clear commitment that we're working together and we've been sharing drafts uh, of our engagement strategies with with them as well to sort of get their feedback on how to do it and how how we can involve people from across the sector. But well, I guess one of the things about the, the voluntary sector itself is it's, it's vast and huge and hugely varied. Um, and um, I'm sure that there's a whole a whole range of different pathways in which the voluntary sector will will be involved in how we plan and uh, deliver um, better services in the future. Thank you. Uh, perhaps um, on your website, is there a link to the Alliance that um, different or, or organisations can go to? That uh, might be a good start. Noted. Thank you. Well, I think, um, uh, Robert, you sort of stopped and said, shall we take questions before you talked about um, what's next? And I can't see any more um, hands up or uh, questions, I think, that we'll, that we'll put in the chat. So perhaps you could um, wrap up the session with us in terms of what's next. Brilliant. So uh, everybody, thank you so much for the different contributions and questions. It's been really helpful for us as, as we start to look forward. Um, uh, as we said at the beginning, there's, there we're in a for, formal period of engagement. That formal period of engagement will end uh, on Sunday evening. So if, if you are able to provide your feedback formally through that channel, then that would be really helpful uh, as we try to take different bits of feedback into account. Uh, we will be producing an engagement report. That engagement report um, we are hoping will be uh, available from the 10th of February, um, which will summarise the feedback that we received uh, through this process. Um, and then once we've got that engagement report, uh the, there is a process whereby the uh the team that's been involved in developing the strategy will will consider the feedback that we've got um to turn that into a final version of the strategy document um that will be for the integrated care partnership to consider uh and hopefully sign off um in march uh, at which point again this will become a a, a publicly available document Thank you very much, Rob. And can I just take this moment to remind everyone, if you haven't, you still have uh, an opportunity to share your views on the strategy by going to, um, by completing the questionnaire at that um, link that it's going to take us another 10 minutes for me to read out. So I'm, I just hope that you can, you can all see it. Um, and um, I hope that you've all found it a useful um, opportunity to share your views and that what will happen, what will come out of after, obviously the, all, all the um, completed questionnaires plus the three um, online sessions and other activities to um, we will see that you've been heard when the final strategy is published and that there is some um, response and in that. So I'd just like to thank the panel for coming today. I do think I, everybody managed to get a question. Thank you everyone who asks questions and puts comments in the in the chat box. They will all be taken into account and listened to by um, the the team. And I wish you all a good good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ros. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Ros. Very good. Cheers. Thank you, bye.